The Octagon returns to Anaheim, California this Saturday for UFC 298. In the main event, the current featherweight champion, Alexander the Great Volkanovsky, puts his gold on the line against El Matador, Ilya Taporia. In the co-main event, former middleweight champion Robert Whittaker battles the hard-hitting Paolo Costa, plus Ireland's own Ian Machado Gary looks to make a statement at welterweight when he takes on Jeff, hands of steel, Neil. Welcome to Fight Week on TNT Sports. This is your official preview for UFC 298. I'm Adam Catterall. Pleasure, as always, to be in your company and the company of these two, Mr. Nick Pete and the Hall of Famer himself, the one and only Mr. Michael Bispin, who's got a big smile on his face, ladies and gentlemen. That's right, because he doesn't have to get on a plane for this event, does he? No, it's round the... Co- he can walk. He can walk to the venue. Guy, your sunshine. Anaheim, California, on his doorstep. Oh, yes. It makes a nice change. Let me tell you, not getting any air miles for this trip. Yeah, it's right by Disneyland. Every night when I go to bed, I can hear the fireworks going off every single night. It does my head in. But <laughs> on this occasion, it works out for the best because, yeah, in my backyard, kind of. I'm from Clitheroe, of course. But, uh, yeah, I'm excited for this one. And what a fight card it is. I haven't got to jump on a plane. I get to commentate. I'll be there ringside with Joe Rogan and top to bottom. An incredible night of fights. That main event is fantastic. The co-main event is ridiculous. Star-studded fighters in every single bout. Yeah, it's going to be a good one. Nick, he's just got me thinking about UFC Clitheroe. That'd be something, wouldn't it? Oh, Early, let's on go. Cobble, <laughs> on, on the cobbles down the main street. That'd be tremendous. We could do it in the Civic Hall, the old cinema, okay? Holds about 100 people, you know? It's like That's the all. new Apex. <laughs> Lancashire's version of the Apex. <laughs> I'm buying it. I'm going to do it. Do it. <laughs> all in all, Nick, quality card this. This looks stacked from top to bottom, as Mike says. It's phenomenal. You know, and is, is it just me or do we get more Alexander Volkanovsky fight weeks and big fight weekends <laughs> than anybody else at the moment? He just seems to be on every other pay-per-view card in the US. And that's because he's built from a different cloth and he's a different type of fighter. He knows he's in the peak of his powers right now, or so he believes. He's dared to be great on two occasions. He bounced back in the middle to defend this featherweight belt, a belt he's, well, a division he's never even lost in in his entire career, but he faces a real test this weekend because Ilya Tapora is the next generation. This is not a Max Holloway or even Islam of this generation. This is the next generation who are coming to take over, and he's at the front. Uh, right, all that being said and done, let's get stuck into the preview of UFC 298. Got a special treat for you coming up a little bit later on. Ian Machado Gary is going to be on the show with us, previewing his own fight against Jeff Neal. Before we get to that, though, let's get stuck into the main event. Featherweight Championship on the line. Alexander the Great Volkanovsky, undefeated at 145, taking on Ilya Toporia. This is a quality, quality matchup, Mike. Not if you ask Ilya Taporia. If you ask Ilya Taporia, he's going to go out there. He's going to smoke him in the first round. He's going to make Volkanovski look pathetic. And then he's not even going to defend against the top contender in the division. He's taking on Conor McGregor. He's going to give him a red panty knife. Then he's going to take on Sugar Sean O'Malley. Okay. <laughs> this guy is brimming with confidence and rightly so. 14 and 0, 12 stoppages. The last fight against Josh Emmett was the one time it went to a decision in the UFC, I think. But what a fight that was. What a display of boxing that we saw from this man. And let me tell you, this guy's not a one-trick pony. He's been grappling since he was a little kid. Started Greco-Roman wrestling. We saw that on display against Bryce Mitchell, a man that was undefeated at that point. He can box. He can kick. He can submit people. He can take people down. He's got a gas tank for days. On the flip side, Volkanovski, we all know about the resume of this guy. We know he's coming back from the knockout from Islam Mahachev. I don't think it's too soon. Four months is plenty of time. He told me that he did all the correct protocol for concussions, etc. Uh, he also said, listen, going into that fight, I was drinking every day for a few weeks, which is to be understood, you know what I mean? Because the man's having a bit of time off, he can enjoy himself. It's summer in Australia, he's having a few barbies, throwing a few shrimp on, having a couple of scoops. Nothing wrong with that, but he thought he could roll the dice and be great. Didn't work out. Because of that, you cannot underestimate the resume of this man. Alexander Volkanovsky, the way that he shut out Max Holloway, one, two, but the third time was phenomenal, okay? I think Taporia is maybe underestimating what he has on his hands here, but it all mounts up to be a fantastic fight. It really does. Listen, if we could concentrate on the challenger for 
a short period of time, Nick, because everything that Mike's just said there, I think we would all concur with it. But one thing that was also super impressive when we've, we've watched him live a couple of times, but in particular in the fight against Jai Herbert, the lad can take a dig as well mm-hmm. and bounce back and come back in order to get the victories when he's maybe lost that first round. Yeah, he swallowed that headshot, didn't he, against Jai Herbert. And he said afterwards, that's the hardest he's ever been hit. He'd never even seen it coming, but he made the adjustments, come out in the second round and, and gets the finish himself. That's the mark of a great fighter. You know, he's had six fights in the UFC, this guy. Four of, all wins, of course, his whole career's wins. Four of those have been finishers of well, and three of those came with a performance bonus. They put him in with Mr. Jiu-Jitsu, Ryan Hall. That was baffling everybody. He just basically annihilated him, threw him out, literally picked him up, threw him out the octagon. You're never to be seen in this sport again. Go back to the mats, kidder. Get your black belt and never come back. Then he goes in there with Jai Herbert, weight division above, has murder with Paddy, swallows a big one, finishes the fight. Then he goes in there with the submission king, Bryce Mitchell, submits the submission king. And then he goes toe-to-toe with Mr. Highlight Reel in this weight division, Josh Emmett, as War and Peace wins a fight of the night. That's why he's here. He's here on credit. However, however, if you want to look at it the other way, he's not beaten anybody currently ranked in the top six in this weight division. And Emmett is one of only two in the top 15, including Bryce, that he's beaten as well. So it's a huge step up to go from beating two ranked guys to suddenly fighting what was the best fight to pound for pound on the planet. He better be ready because the leap he's about to take is massive. It is kind of by default, though, isn't it, Mike, as, as Nick's alluding to there, because Volkanovski's been brilliant in this weight division. Everything that's been put in front of him, he's dealt with it, not with ease, because there's been some tough ones in there as well, but he's absolutely come, them, come through them with shining colours. So therefore, to put his next up, don't yeah. get me wrong, he's earned it, but he's next up by default. Yeah, you, no, you're absolutely right. He's sweep the deck. He's cleaned the deck. He's taken out all the contenders. So therefore, people like Taporia, they now get their shot because Holloway three times, Brian Ortega. I mean, the list goes on, right? Um, and I think when you look at Volkanovski, yeah, listen, of course, Taporia is going to be uh, confident. He's going to be a little bit cocky, a little bit arrogant. Of course, he's undefeated. He's undefeated. He's representing two nations, Georgia and Spain. He's got a tremendous amount of support, okay? And we just... Listen, look, look at Ian Gary. Look at any fighter that's undefeated. They have never tasted defeat. They have never stepped in, stepped into a professional environment, competing environment, and lost. So therefore, you, your confidence is through the roof. But Volkanovski just went toe-to-toe with Makachev for five rounds. When he had a full camp, look how close that fight was, right? We all know how good Makachev is. Everybody agrees he's right now the pound-for-pound number one fighter on the planet. Okay, he showed up half a version of himself. I'm not taking away from Islam, right? He was on two weeks' notice. It was a close fight on a full camp, but on two weeks' notice, how do you think that's going to go better? But I respect the courage of the man, but it didn't go his way. But if you forget about that fight, because, you know, maybe in hindsight wasn't the smartest move, look at the fight before with Islam. Look at the way he was able to stop the takedowns, knock him down, get takedowns of his own. And honestly... Everyone in that arena thought that Volkanovski won. I had Islam winning it, but it was one of those fights. It could have gone either way. That's the true Volkanovski. I think Tapori is looking at the last one where he got knocked out and he's putting too much stock in that. But rightly so. That's what you do as a fighter. You look at somebody at their worst and go, this guy sucks. I am going to smoke him. I am going to make this look ridiculous. I'm going to embarrass the guy. Hey, we'll see what happens. Nick, you know what I'm going to do now, man. Here it comes. Here comes the 35-year-old stats. For those that don't know about this, that I say on every single show when there's a 35-year-old man (laughs) in those lower weight divisions that he's competing for championship belts, I state that never in the history of the UFC between 125 right through to 155 has anybody won or even defended once they've hit the age of 35. Mr. Volkanovski now is 35 years of age. He's going to have to defy a bit of science and a bit of history if he's going to come through this fight with Ilya Tapura. But if any man on the planet can defy history, it's Alexander Volkanovsky. They don't call him Alex the Great for nothing. And his career professes that. This is a guy that started up at middleweight, welterweight or whatever it was. There's three defeats in his entire career. One came at welterweight pre-UFC. The other two, of course, against Islam. The first fight, I thought he just pinched it in Perth. I really did. I thought he'd just done enough. Second fight, unfortunately for him, absolutely conclusive in October. And that's what I keep circling back to. I'm not necessarily like Ilya, putting too much stock in it. 
But I am looking at the fact that that was Volk's ninth consecutive UFC title fight over just a short couple of years. You know, there's a lot of miles on that clock now, and it seems to define him as an individual. He's spoken many times. He doesn't know how to switch off and be a dad and be with his kids, and he has to be in a fight camp, and he wants to maximise the potential where he's at right now. But that is that making him take unnecessary chances? Are we about to see another Israel Adesanya versus Sean Strickland type flat performance because it's just too much too much activity, too much championship reign. The weight of that gold is just maybe weighing on the shoulders. There's no reason to believe any man can beat him at 145 pounds until he gets beat. And of course, he will get beat at some stage. Mm. So Porter comes into this as a massive, massive underdog, but definitely worth a look at underdog more than anything because of where Volk's coming from. That was a bad loss in October. That was a proper knockout. Those fights stick with you. And I've heard Volk say the same thing, Mike. I was drinking every day, all that stuff. If you're 35 years of age and you're, you honestly want to remain the UFC champion, you don't drink every day. You don't do that. You look after yourself in a different way. So I don't know where Volk is mentally right now, but if there's a chink in that armor, I think the Matador could expose it. Well, I will say this. He's extremely motivated to shut everyone up. People like yourself, Nick, yeah. I'm not saying you're being critical, but all the people online that say that he's done, that he's washed up. Now, listen, Adam, we can all quote stats from Instagram, okay? You know what I mean? But I'm going <laughs> to give you a bit of actual detailed analysis. Shut That's all you're going to do. Man. Just go online. Oh, here's the stats, you know, MMA sucker punch or whatever they are. Adam, stay offline, okay? Hardcore analysis. What are you talking about? It's my stat! Then it, no, it's not. Are nice no, it's bats. not. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. It is. Oh, you've been studying the numbers. Uh, well, I was up all night <laughs> studying tape like a maniac, okay? Um, Go on. Let's look at the skills, not at the age of these people, because we don't know how well they're aging. I think when you look at it on, on paper, Volk's got the longer reach. He's the shorter guy, 5'8 to 5'6, but he's got like a three-inch reach advantage, okay? I think being the shorter yep. guy in the lower center of gravity, that's going to make him harder to take down. Taporia has been very good at taking people down whenever he wants. But if you look at Volkanovski, he went five rounds with Islam. He was not dominated in that department, the wrestling department at all, by the bigger guy and probably one of the most effective wrestlers that we have in all the mixed martial arts right now. So I think it's kind of a stalemate there. On the ground, he's training mm. with Craig Jones. He's also defending submissions over five rounds from Islam as well. So I think Taporia is going to have a real hard job there. Let's remember, the man has no neck. He has a bowling ball on top of his shoulders, okay? It's going to be hard to choke him out. Um, I think it comes down to the boxing. Now, when you look at Tapori, the mm. man is slick. The way that he rolls his shots, the shot selection, the speed, the way he uses the jab to the body, then comes up to the head, then comes over the top with the right hand. He's got beautiful boxing. I think he's slicker on the feet than Volkanovski, but Volkanovski's shown, and we've sat here many times, wowing in his brilliance, uh, how he gets in and out of range, how fast the footwork is, how well he cuts angles and stuff like that. So I think ultimately all said and done, this will probably turn into a kickboxing match, probably a boxing fight with a few kicks thrown in for good measure. Oh man, you've got me revved up now that you've given me the keys to victory in the way that this fight might play out because it's all set to be an absolute firecracker. Uh, the main event for the featherweight championship fight, uh, all set at UFC 298. It's going to be supported hotly uh, by two lads in Mike's old division, the middleweight guys. And you would look at... Robert Whittaker versus Paolo Costa, Mike. Given the landscape of the division and where this all might start to play out, obviously Dricus Duplessis is the new champion. We think that maybe Dricus Duplessis might fight Israel Adesanya at some point. But if Dricus Duplessis is to come through that and still remain the champion, you would look to this fight as maybe the number one contenders fight, wouldn't you? Robert Whittaker, Paolo Costa, maybe getting themselves back into that title mix. I mean, you're going to upset a lot of Sean Strickland fans with comments like that. My word, brace yourself. You've got Ian Gary hatred coming your way. Um, <laughs> listen, we all love Robert Whittaker and he's had an amazing career and he was the next best guy, but he just got knocked out against Strickland Duplessis. 
Okay, so I think those conversations, because we do have Sean Strickland that was a close one with Drickers. We have got Israel Adesanya, right? If Paolo Costa can get the job done, and that's a big if, then he inserts himself into the conversation. But there's a lot of fresh blood. There's Jared Cannonier out there as well. So I think right now, this is an important fight for Robert Whittaker to establish himself as still as one of the top dogs and still in the mix, still in the hunt. And that's why I respect him, because this is not an easy fight. Paulo Costa mm. is a beast of a human being. Look at that fight that he had with Yoel Romero. He can stop takedowns. No disrespect to Robert. If he can stop Yoel's, he can probably stop Robert's takedowns. On the feet, the chin that Paulo Costa has is phenomenal, right? It, you don't really see him get rocked too often. Sometimes it's his output that affects him. But I just look at that fight that he had with Marvin Vittori. Over five rounds, them two just battered the life out of one another, just kicked the hell, punched each other. I, mean, I was there, you could hear the shots in the apex. They were loud. They were sickening thuds every time they connected. And Costa was never wobbled once, okay? The only thing that's been hurting Costa is, okay, obviously, he never showed up against Israel Adesanya. That was an awful performance. Or maybe that was just Izzy's masterclass. Uh, but his, mm. his schedule... His strength of schedule has yeah. been terrible. So this is a big fight. Now, can Robert Whittaker out-finesse him, out-skill him? Yes, he can. But can Robert take the shots that Paolo Costa is going to give him? Because he's going to connect, and he just got sat down with a jab. I'm not saying there's a lot of miles on the clock of Robert Whittaker. Wikipedia is. Just look at the record. Look at the wars with Yoel Romero. Look at what the man's been through. He's still a young man, but he's had a lot of miles on the clock. But I'm a big Whittaker fan. May the best man win. Bis been having a go at me for having a look at Instagram and he's making Wikipedia references on the show. <laughs> that's Jeez. where the records Jeez. are. That's where the records no, are. That's where... No, the, the, no. The, the normal people on the street making those inputs. No, 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 no. There, that's the <laughs> record. You go to Wikipedia... It's, it's just records and from those facts, those numbers I'm ah, formulating okay. Okay, and... and Garnishing my own opinion, of which is absolutely perfect and correct. <laughs> anyway, Nick, listen, as Mike said, he's, bit, he's frustrating Paulo Costa because we don't see him enough. And he seems to have got the fans on side. They, they, they buy into his personality. They buy into who he is. And every time he fights, nine times out of ten, not every time, nine times out of ten, it is super entertaining. So we need to see him more often. Yeah, you've got to be an old-school UFC fan to remember Paolo Costa in his halcyon <laughs> days. You know, his signature wins so far are Johnny Hendricks and Yol Romero. They sailed off into the sunset years ago. You know, and he's, he's just, as you say, he's just not active enough at all. I was there the last time he fought in Salt Lake City when Leon Edwards won the title. That was August of 2022. Prior to that, the Marvin Vittori fight that Mike talks about. Yeah, sensational fight. That was October of 2021. Mm -hmm. That was the year after he lost to Izzy. It's just nowhere near enough activity. And then when he does get out, the Vittori fight, fantastic. Go back, watch it. It's a real slobber knocker. Fantastic stuff. Let's not forget he turned up 25 pound overweight or whatever it was for that fight. It was ridiculous. He was completely and utterly out of shape. And I was ringside in Salt Lake City when he fought Luke Rockhold. The two of them looked like they were going to pass out from exhaustion. He wasn't in great shape then either. So I've got absolutely no expectation of what to expect from Paolo Costa this weekend. I really haven't, because I haven't seen enough of him to think, is he going to turn up that chiseled monster that got himself a shot of the title against Izzy, this big, huge, powerful wrecking machine? Or is this out-of-weight, out-of-shape lump going to turn up, miss weight again, and get in there with... with uh, with Robert Whittaker, who on his heyday, absolutely technically for me, one of the best middleweights we've seen. But you're only as good as your last fight. And last time out, Robert Whittaker got smashed to bits by Drickers Duplessis. I don't know what's going to happen. I really don't. You're absolutely right in what you say, Nick, apart from a few factual mistakes. He's 32 years old, right? He hasn't been active. He is 32. He did show up against Marvin Vittori, Wikipedia, 20 you know. pounds overweight, okay? But he went five rounds. He still went five rounds, so he wasn't out of shape. He was overweight. I don't know what he was doing there. Listen, I'm not on the Paolo Costa bandwagon. He's come for me on social mm -hmm. media many, many times. However, <laughs> you can't deny the fact that the man... 
is tremendous when he fights. And yes, Robert Whittaker, mm. we, we've, we saw the masterclass in Paris against Marvin Vittori. If you compare those two fights, I mean, th th there's not even a comparison. Whittaker, the footwork, no. the boxing, the rest and the takedown, the experience, you put it all together. But the one thing that worries me for, in, for Robert Whittaker in this is the chin. Costa was able to take those shots of Vittori, okay? Robert Whittaker didn't have to because he was able to move in and out and all the rest of it. But now after the knockout from Drickus Duplessis, can he still take that kind of damage? And it's just the miles on the clock. I love Robert Whittaker. I'm on the bandwagon. I, 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 he's, we all do. He's just such a great mm -hmm. human being and an incredible fighter. It's just a tough fight, but I understand why he's doing it because this fight, this win, puts him right back in there, right back in the conversation. There you go. That's your co-main event. Robert Whittaker taking on Paolo Costa. And of course, the main event, the featherweight championship between Alexander Volkanovsky and Ilya Topuria. A little bit of a gear change now because we're going to bring in a fourth face. That's right. You don't want to look at three old men. You want to look at a young buck that is still in his fighting prime and kindly joining us ahead of his fight with Jeff Neal is the one and only Ian Gary. Welcome to the show, sir. How are you? Good, man. Good. Couldn't be better right now. Well, that's a fair... Hang on a minute. That's not how you normally join us on the programme, man. There's normally a rap, there's normally a dance, there's normally uh -huh. a bounce into the show. This is very... Uh, this is very zenian. What's going yeah, on? Yeah, yeah. I've got a, a lot of people to prove wrong. up going into this fight, haven't I? I've got to be... got to have a different approach. I'm going in there with business to go after. Look at that. Bleep Machine's going to be going absolutely wild. If you Just a I reminder, Ian. If you think I've had a point Ian. to prove before, one sec. If you think I've ever had a point to prove before, watch this one, and then you'll all see. Look at that. Super stuff. Uh, this just a little reminder, my man. I know that you're used to obviously having a conversation with us and it all and it's all guns blazing. But uh, my boss at TNT Sports will be at me for the bleep machine, all right? So just on the profanity, if we could just tone it just a touch, buddy. All right, of mate? Of course, of course, of course. Thank you. And I appreciate kind it. Kind of on that note, Ian, toning it down. Uh, <laughs> have, have you got any plans to tone down your kind of persona leading into this one? Because as you say, you've got a lot of people to prove wrong. Are you using this as motivation? Because let's be honest, online, there's been every man and the dog coming for you. They're all talking a lot of smack. Are you looking at this fight with Jeff Neal, who, of course, on paper, is your toughest fight yet as a way to go out there, silence Jeff Neal, but also silence the thousands of people that are jumping on the bandwagon, the Sean Strickland fans that are coming after you online? I don't believe... Any performance that I can go out there and put on is going to silence people. They'll always be haters. The more success you have, the more haters they are. That's just, unfortunately, the way the online, the online community is right now, and it's, it's ridiculous. But am I going to use that, that oh, fuel to go out there and put on a performance to maybe rile them up and f them off a little more? Then yeah, why not? Why not get under their skin a little bit more about my hand raise? Why not go out there and body Jeff Neal and stand over his body and just look at everyone around the stadium and see people's faces as I go out there and I just stand there and I go, this is what I do. This is what I do best. The truth is the, the MMA community should be thankful because everybody's videos that were posted that had my name in it got much more, much more traction and more views. This being your videos included, right? Like everyone. Everyone posted about it. Everyone talked about it. And the truth is, I guarantee you go back and look at your videos. Those videos at that time got the most views. And you had people talking about me, talking about the rest, not, not fact-checking, not doing anything. But the truth is, I'm still going to show up and do my job this time. I'm going to get my hand raised. I'm going out to 14 and 0. And if anyone has a problem or anyone has anything to say, I couldn't care less. We talked about, about it at the time, Ian. And we talked about you being somewhere in Brazil training with, you know, some of the best jiu-jitsu guys ever to do it in, you know, some favela. You're in Sao Paulo right now. And we were saying, he's probably just turned his phone off. The rest of the world's losing their minds about Ian Gary and everything's going on. And he's probably just got his phone off laughing, training away, because you're not yet a UFC champion. You're not yet a UFC title contender. Mm -hmm. And yet your name for the last six months was the first name on every fighter's lips across pretty much every single weight division. Seems like I'm doing something right then, doesn't it? If I'm, if I'm at this point in my career and everybody's talking about me and everybody's talking about me for whatever reason it is, good, bad, positive, negative, whatever you want to call it, I must be doing something right. If we just take a, a couple of steps back to December, because obviously we wanted to see you mm -hmm. at uh, UFC 
296. Yeah. Um, and obviously that didn't materialise. How, no. how has the recovery been since being diagnosed with pneumonia? Obviously, you've fallen into our Wayne show. We could tell that you couldn't breathe there, mate. You mm-hmm. were struggling a little bit. So how's the recovery been? As, as good as it possibly could be. I, I took the time off to respect and heal, like respect the recovery and the healing process. You have to with something like your lungs. Um, if it was a sore hand or something, you'd fight through it. But when you can't breathe and you're in bed sweating and losing kilos of weight, it was like, it's just something that you have to give nothing but 100% respect to. So right now, Everything's back on track. The fitness is there. The speed is there. The power is there. The energy is there. Everything is ready to go. And like I said, I'm, I'm excited to prove it. Was Luke re-offered? And originally this was supposed to be Miami and 299, but obviously we're at 298. So what's happened in that process? So this is where I don't understand what gets said to people. On fight week... When I was diagnosed, when, when we had to call the fight and the doctor came and he diagnosed me and he called the fight off and he told the bosses, there's no way he's going to be able to compete. Me, my team and the UFC wanted to rebook something ASAP. That week, within two days, we had been back and forth talking about what's next, where can we do it next? So they basically gave me two options. You can have Luke in January or you can have Jeff Neal in February. I turned to them and said, your doctor told me if I'm fighting in January, it's probably a bad idea because I might not be 100% recovered. So that means January's a no-go, let's do Feb. That was it. Mm-hmm. Dana then came out after that and was like, Ian Gary versus Jeff Neal in Miami. I'm like, what the f***? <laughs> when? What? Um, so yeah, it, I only ever got those options. Jeff Neal, Feb, Luke A in January. Well, on the Jeff Neal matchup, obviously a guy that's been around for a long time, good boxing, But I think when I look at the matchup, you know, you're a taller and faster and more clinical striker, if I'm honest. If you look at the Mm -hmm. last fight that Jeff Neal had against Shavkat Rachmanov, you could make some kind of similarities or comparisons with yourself in terms of body type and Shavkat Rachmanov. Yes. However, even though Shavkat got the finish in round three and it was a sensational fight, fight of the night, um, Uh one of the things that I thought Shavkat did wrong was allow himself to be in the pocket too long. And any time he was in the pocket, that was when Jeff Neal was able to counter and land some shots. If I'm training you, Mm -hmm. if I am you, I'm using the reach the range, staying on the outside, using the speed and the range and picking him apart. Am I on the right track in terms of what the approach is going to be? I mean, let's put it this way. I was able to dominate the range and the, the distance with Neil Magny with absolute ease. And he's six foot three and has an 80 and a half inch reach. There's no way Jeff Neal's touching me. It's absolutely control the distance, dominate, dominate the hand fight. He, you said he has great boxing. That's all he has. He's only got boxing. He barely throws kicks. He barely enters a takedown. I'll give him credit. He's got phenomenal takedown defense, but that's because he's a boxer and doesn't want to be putting his back. So it's very simple. Like with every fight, it's not, oh, like how can I go out there and do the most amazing thing? It's how can I win with the easiest way possible and do it in the most fantastic fashion? And that's going out there and making them look like an amateur. So I think controlling the distance is absolutely key and not standing in the pocket. If I'm standing in the pocket, I'm fighting at his range. If I'm fighting at his range, I'm being an idiot. I'm longer, I'm taller, I'm faster. Use my movement, use my speed and dominate the fight. The finish will come. He will have to enter my range to try and touch me. And when he does, that's when the finishes will come because he's giving me his momentum. Just got to play it out and play it cool until that point. The fight with Shavkat, Jeff did put in a good performance, as Mike says, a fight of the night bonus winner. But he also entered the fight overweight. And there's a difference between failing to make weight and missing weight. And I believe he failed to make weight. It was a conscious decision. Are you expecting mm-hmm. that kind of stuff from Jeff this time around? Maybe not a miss weight, but you know that you guys have got water under the bridge already. Are you expecting antics out of him in his camp? If he wants to come in overweight, that's that's his problem. I will sit him down in a sauna and I'll watch him cut weight for that extra hour and whatever weight he gets in, I'll go, all right, you tried. You've just absolutely depleted your body to the point at which you maybe can't compete anymore and that's your own fault. So if he wants to have those antics, 
then I'll be the person to sit down and go, I'll go into the sauna with you and I'll look you in the eye while I sip water. That's on him. If I do my job, I sign up on weight, you do your job. There's two things you do when you sign up to fight. You sign up to an agreed weight and you sign up to show up on the fight. If you miss the first one, you can't do the second one. So, yep. I, that's on him. That's his job. Ian, I think we can all tell that you're ready to get back to business, obviously, uh, this week at UFC 298, man. We're excited to see you back in the Octagon because so far it's been absolutely fantastic to watch. But how has the last five months in particular been for you outside of the Octagon? And, and I'm sure Mike maybe can talk about this as well from his own career. It's all well and good having a bit of banter with other fighters when they're giving it to you, but when they're giving it to your family and extended people that you love, that must be a very, very difficult uh, process to kind of, uh, to process yourself. I mean, of course, of course, I feel like when I signed up to fight, I'm putting myself in that kind of limelight, in that firing range. I have that target on my back. My wife doesn't, my son doesn't, my team doesn't. You fire me all you want, that's okay. I'm, I'm, I'm in this, I get to go in and punch someone in the face and get rid of it and I get to go in and I can call you out and I can fight you and we can do this. Um, but to attack people's loved ones and people's family, I feel is real low. I mean, my wife got called a pedophile. No woman in the world who isn't that gets deserved to, deserves to be called that. So all of the shit that's been said absolutely has an effect on me and my loved ones. And it's hurtful and it's upsetting and it was difficult to deal with at the time. But we've learned from it. Somehow, through all that negativity, we've learned to pull the people around us closer. If you don't eat at my table, I don't care for your opinion. Lads, I like every single one of you, but if you go on and say something about me, the truth is anymore, I don't care. I don't care anymore. And I'm not sitting down with you guys having dinner. So you can, and, and it's your job to talk, so go talk. But I'm not going to take offense to it anymore because I've got the people that surround me, that love me, that, that are there for me in good times, in bad times, that want to see me succeed, that will help push me. I found what I'm looking for in a gym. The guys that shoot the box are absolutely phenomenal. The fact that they sit there and the day before I was meant to leave, he says, hey, we've, one of the, the head coaches there, um, Cicero, Everyone at the end of the session stands around. He says, Ian, Layla, we thank you for being here. We're, we're glad you're part of this team. We've seen the, we've seen the stuff online. And we want to let you know that we think it's all <laughs> We think that you guys are amazing. And we love that you come to this gym with your family. We love that you bring this energy. We love that you guys are a team because not many people in this world have the ability to travel everywhere with their family. Not many people are able to do this journey and bring their loved ones that close and share this adventure with them. And I know that. I've met lots of fighters who leave their wives, leave their kids, miss out on things for fights and all of these things. I'm being a good human and a good man. And that's all that matters to me. So if anyone wants to go out there and say anything negative, then be my guest. Because the truth is now, I don't care anymore. I just don't care. Well, that's certainly a mature approach, Ian. And you're doing the right thing because the reality is in this game, you got to have thick skin. Right. I mean, I know, as Adam alluded to, in America, I used to be public enemy number one. Now I, I do OK. The fickle, you know, you say <laughs> one thing, they, they all go crazy. And then the next week, if you turn it around, you know, they're all back on board. So it doesn't matter because, as you say, you haven't got to see these people and some anonymous trolls on Twitter. Who cares? Right. That's the reality. That said, but the truth is, the, plan, the truth is, the truth is, though, I'm getting more love than ever. So all you're seeing is a, a small minority of people online that are being bitter and aggressive and hurtful, mainly the strong Strickland followers, do you know what I mean? That, that's mainly where it came from. But the truth is, every country I've been in since that point, uh, America, England, Ireland, Brazil, I'm being recognized more. My, my merch sales have gone up, my followers have gone up, my ambassador deals have gone up. I'm raising the value of everything around me. And the truth is, the love I'm getting from people, I haven't had a single bit of hate in public. I've met, I've met hundreds of people. The fight night in Vegas, in Vegas airport, people come up to me like, oh man, we just flew here just to see you. We hope you're all right, we've seen the hate, we love you, we're followers of you, we hope you're, you guys come back and answer this amazingly. And I'm like, you know I will. In Brazil, I'm being recognized way more than I ever have been. In England, in Ireland, I can't walk down a road without being seen and being noticed. And I didn't even fight. 
So everybody's talking about me and the value of me is just rising, rising, rising. Like I alluded to earlier on, everyone in the dog is talking about me. I haven't fought yet. I haven't done the things I'm saying. I'm number 10 in the world. I haven't even gone in and done everything I want to do. It's coming. It's coming. And I cannot wait to prove everybody wrong with all this negativity and all this by just enjoying the positive energy that I'm getting from everyone that I meet in public and just enjoying the team around me. So you say you haven't fought yet, but you will be doing this weekend against Jeff Neal at Tough Fight mm -hmm. in California, USA. There's going to be a lot of that negative fan base there. And when it comes down to it on the night, there's a bit of theatrics. It becomes kind of like pantomime villains and stuff like that. So let's just mm -hmm. imagine a scenario where you go out there, you walk out, you fight, you win, you look great. And they're all playing along with the pantomime villain. They're all booing. What does Ian Gary do? Does he sit back? Does he maturely say, guys, guys, come on and try and win them over? Or do you go full heel, just lean into it and tell everyone to go to hell? Which way are we going, Ian? I, I, think, I think that depends on... So... The truth is what, is, what stays true to me and my values and the person I am, right? I'm not going to sit there and berate people in, in a stadium... Whether they're booing or not, that's your opinion, fine. What I will do is I'll bury Jeff Neal into the ground, I'll stand over his body, I'll do a 360 and I'll look and I'll assess every single person who I make eye contact with, and when I get on that mic, I'll use that mic to do what it's best for, and I'll call out who's next, and I'll line up what I want next, who I want next, where I want next, and I'll get what I want because that's how what power I have now. That's the power that I have. It's in my hands now. There's guys in the... the there's, you could argue that fight week, Leon and Kobe, or me, what was talked about more? Who had more traction going into that fight week? The champion and the number one contender in my division, or me, the guy number 10 in the world? So I have that power now, I have that traction, I have that publicity, I have people talking about me. I'll go out there and I'll use that for the right things, not to berate people. I'll use it for the right things and I'll stay true to myself. There still could be a spot there at UFC 300. Could we turn around for UFC 300? Nah. Nah. Unless Connor's on that card and I get to share a card with Connor, I have other plans. I, as all I know now is that we've got February and the only rumour we hear is from the big man himself saying that he'd like to fight June 29th in International Fight Week. Now, fingers crossed that gets made because if that gets made, I have a perfect coming man. And I think you guys can guess who it might be. Maybe, maybe, my man. Yeah, he's a bit of a clown there, if you want any hints. <laughs> Listen, it's going to be uh, some fight, uh, you and Jeff Neal, obviously. I think mm -hmm. there's a few fans actually waiting for you to get on that microphone and do what you need to do at the end of UFC uh, 298. Should be box office, as will the microphone work pre-fight. Um, should be quite tasty on them press conference top tables. Ian, thank you so much for joining us, mate. Have a wonderful week. Have a lovely safe cut. And we'll see you in the octagon come Saturday night. Take care, my friend. I appreciate you guys. Thank you. All the best. See you soon. Top man. Top man. There you go. Ian Machado, Gary, uh, joining us there uh, in the build-up to his fight with Jeff Neal. Should be an absolute cracking fight. And we've got more to get stuck into, boys, so we better get cracking. Can you imagine the top table with him and Henry Segudo? Anyway, let's get into that fight, shall we? Uh, because, Mike, Mirab Divrashvili, um, we thought was on the cusp of fighting for a title. It's not going to be him next. It's Cheeto Vera taking on Sean O'Malley. But you would think that Mirab versus Henry Cejudo on this card at 298 is some type of eliminator for the number one spot to be next up for a shot at the title. Yeah, I mean, it's got to be, hasn't it? I mean, who else can there be? I mean, yes, there's Corey Sandhagen, but Marab Devalishvili, he is right there. He is campaigning and he's beating ch former champion after former champion. Last time out, Piorian, Jose Aldo. You go down the list, nothing but top contenders and the way he's taking them out. And now the kind of spotlight that he's getting and this kind of personality that he's developed, the videos that he's doing, mm -hmm. mocking the rest of the division. This guy is very, very entertaining. And inside the octagon, it's nonstop pressure, amazing rest in cardio for days and decent boxing against Henry Cejudo we all know Henry the king of cringe the triple C we all know about his accolades and the career that he's had but where is he right last time out against Aljamain Sterling I thought he would do better than what he did. I thought it was a tremendous fight. I thought both men did great, but Aljamain clearly won. I think a lot of people going into that one thought, listen, so who does going to out-wrestle him? Look at the credentials he has, the Olympic bronze medalist, uh, or gold medalist, pardon me, what am I saying? Um, but that wasn't the case. 
That isn't what happened. That's not what we saw. So is he slowing down? Is he getting older? Mm. Of course, there's a lot of miles on the clock, a lot of wear and tear. And Marab Devalishvili on the flip side seems to be getting into his prime. Nick, you know what I'm going to do again, mate? I did it at the start of the show. I'm going to talk about 35-year-old fellas in these weight divisions. And as Mike's just alluded to there, uh, Henry Secudo, where are you at with him? Are you where Mike's just alluded to there? Is he slowing down? Is has his time kind of been at the very, very top in this division? Uh, well, he's 36 years of age, you know, but just kind of, just like Volk at the top of the show, if anyone can turn it round, if anyone can book the trend, it's the former Olympic champion, the former two-weight, former UFC champion. So you wouldn't bet against Henry Cejudo, but rather like Mike, you know, I know he was out for a long time. He retired after solidifying his reign at bantamweight with the win over Dominic Cruz. He goes and retires. He tries to bounce back out of retirement after three years and goes the distance with Aljo. But he looked flat. He looked old. Mm. He looked every inch 36 years of age. I would like to have seen him fight Cheeto at the back end of last year. That fight was scheduled until Henry pulled out of it. I think that is probably working against him as well. And when you go on in with someone like Mirab, you know, Mirad is a, he's not called the machine for nothing, is he? He's a relentless machine. Most takedowns in bantamweight history, uh, most unanimous point wins in bantamweight history. But also you combine that with the second most number of strikes landed in bantamweight history as well. He is the full package, Mirab. And as Mike pointed out, you're talking about a guy who's been the top of the tree that planted his flag on the top of the mountain and is on his way down. And you've got young, hungry Mirab that's got the Georgian flag on his back looking to become the first Georgian UFC champion. Hungry as anything. Yeah. Just like to clarify my uh, stats of 35-year-old fellas. He's in championship fights. This obviously isn't a championship fight. So Henry Ciudo has a sniff. There you go. Go on, Mike. What did you want to say, man? Can I just jump in with one last uh, nugget on that fight there? I think for Henry Cejudo, the game plan for this one is pretty simple. Don't wrestle, okay? Because that's what mm -hmm. he did against Aljamain Sterling. Tried to wrestle non-stop, non-stop. And Al he couldn't do it to Aljamain. Aljamain trains with Merab, right? So you've got to draw some parallels, shall we say, in their style. Um, but I think when it comes to boxing, the striking on the feet, Cejudo's probably got cleaner boxing. He's got very, very good power as well for bantamweight. So I think if he just abandons the game plan strategy, reserves and saves all of that energy, because pushing for mm. takedowns the whole time is so exhausting. So save that energy. The reflexes will be on point because the man's been grappling since he was in nappies. You know what I mean? So when Marab's going forward, wasting all of that energy, if he just focuses on keeping the fight on the feet and using the boxing we could see Henry Cejudo possibly book your trend Adam I'm not saying that that's a prediction but I'm just saying that if I was training him just like if I was training Ian Machado or Gary that would be the plan just box the guy <laughs> I love it uh, kicking off this main card uh, we've got Anthony Hernandez who is a ranked fighter obviously in the middleweight division taking on a guy I think that we've all been super impressed with recently Roman Kopilov, he's one of those guys that is just bubbling under this ranking system that could come through. And obviously, if a win at the weekend, could get himself in the top 15, Mike. Stylistically, this matches up well. Yeah, look, listen, Roman Kopilov, I love watching this guy, right? He's, he's such a great striker. And I think it's four or five in a row now, and they're all knockouts. He's very tall for the division. But Anthony Fluffy Hernandez... This is a guy that is criminally underrated, that doesn't get spoken mm -hmm. about enough. And it's so nice to see him on the main card of a pay-per-view. Um, he, he's upset so many people. Like Rodolfo Vieira, he, when he came to the UFC, there was all this hype about his grappling credentials, the boxing skill that he had, and just the sheer size of him. Fluffy Hernandez was able to get him tired, drag him into deep water, and then get the submission. Fluffy Hernandez does not get the respect that he deserves but he's got a tough fight because Roman Kopilov as I say he's very tall he's a very very slick striker and those head kicks that he possesses are absolutely lethal for Fluffy Hernandez to get this one done he's got to get a hold of him he's got to get him down on the ground I think on the feet Kopilov has got too much he's too quick and too tall and rangy however it's a great fight as I said Anthony Hernandez criminally underrated and little tidbit of information, the first ever fight card that I commentated was in Fortaleza, Brazil, 2nd of February, 2019. And that was when Fluffy Hernandez made his debut. I'm not taking any credit for the career that he's had, but, you know, maybe it's all because of me. <laughs> Look at that. Stats galore on the show. Um, Nick, I know that you've been a fan of Roman Kopilov, like Mike just alluded to there. He is a beautiful striker to watch. 
Yeah, he is. He's outstanding. You know, he's a five-time world combat Sambo champion. So, you, you know, he's, he's absolutely got the pedigree. And, you know, he's here in the UFC now. It didn't quite work for my first. That's not unusual. That can happen. He lost his first two. Since then, 4-0, and oh, all knockouts, couple of bonuses in there for good measure. He actually, he's, he's replacing Ali Askarov for this fight. He actually mm. put his hand up to replace Chris Curtis to face Hernandez at the back end of last year. And after accepting the fight, Hernandez then pulled out before the opening bell. So this is the second time Kopolov's jumped in to face Hernandez. And there's a reason why. And that's because he's an absolute monster. You know, I, I, I've got no surprise there. In fact, when Hernandez pulled out, they replaced him with, uh, with Josh Friend. And Josh Friend got absolutely battered from pillar to post by Kopolyov if you remember he kicked them all over the place there was blood everywhere and then he absolutely stole his soul with a huge left up to the body to finish the show so yeah I'm, I think Kopolyov could be something quite special and now he's putting it together Hernandez better take him down soon baby otherwise he's in big trouble um, we're expecting some serious fireworks at UFC 298. It should be an absolute cracking show. Make sure you tune in to TNT Sports and Discovery Plus. 1 a.m. is when the prelims get going and the main card all kicking off with the fight that we've just been previewing at 3 a.m. in the morning. The cherry on top of the cake is, of course, that featherweight championship fight. Alexander Volkanovsky looking to defy a little bit of history, taking on the young buck from Europe. Ilya Tapura should be a belter. We'll see you at the fights.